Rob, when we talk about DNA, I think most people are probably thinking about all of the human DNA now that comes up. And what are we learning about the DNA of the human being? You know, since we started DNA analysis, uh, basically most everything we've learned has contradicted the standard model, the standard out of Africa idea. The idea that humans and chimpanzees share a common ancestor, the idea that Neanderthals are not human. There's all these things that have come up that are completely contrary to what anyone expected. And how do we, how do we then uh, refute that old story of out of Africa? In a lot of different ways. Um, first of all, we've got DNA sequences now from thousands of people from all over the world. And it's, there's just some things that are very clear. And the first big surprise was how similar people are from one end of the world to the other. Hmm. That was not what people expected. I mean, back in Dar Charles Darwin's day, he was trying to split people up into races and almost into species. Other people claim they are different species. Darwin never quite went that far. But they were, the evolutionists were trying to divide people up into tribes and clades and groups. But what we found out through gene sequencing is that people are nearly identical from one end of the world to the other. Well, what does that commonality of, of genetic code across people all over the earth, what, what does that tell us? What do we learn from that? Oh, it tells us tons of things. First of all, it tells us that we all came from a single small population just a short time ago. Huh. It tells us that there's only been one dispersal of people across the planet. It tells us that the center of diversity of all people in the world is somewhere between Northeast Africa and the Middle East. So the origin of mankind is pretty much where the Bible says it was. The origin of mankind involves a small people group, just like the Bible says. The origin of mankind involves a dispersal across the world. Everything we're learning is pointing more and more toward a biblical answer for the origin of humanity. How do we come to the conclusion uh, that uh, the human race has not been around that long? Well, one thing we can do is we can look at the mutation rate that we can measure in the laboratory. We can take a bunch of people that we know are closer related, we can look at their DNA, we can count up the number of differences between them. Now we can say, okay, that's the rate. Now let's look at all the people around the world. How long would it take to explain all these people given the rate that we know? And the answer is a few thousand years. Mm. For both the, the man's lineages, which is the Y chromosome, and the female lineages, which is the mitochondrial DNA, both of them give us a similar, ancestor, a similar answer that people are not millions of years old. Uh, tell me more about the, the different uh, chromosomes that come as a result of being male or female. How does that help us understand this? Because there are two specific small pieces of DNA that are passed down to generations unchanged, they don't, most chromosomes, they recombine, and so the genes get scrambled. But the Y chromosome is only inherited from father to son to grandson to great-grandson. And so if a mutation occurs, it stays only in that lineage. There's this other little piece of DNA called the mitochondrial DNA that from a lot of experiments, it's only passed on from the mother to the child. So my children did not inherit my mitochondrial DNA. They inherited my wife's mitochondrial DNA. Because of that, it's also passed like the Y chromosome from one generation to the next unchanged. Except if a mutation occurs, you have a now you have new lineage. And so when we look at the Y chromosomes around the world, it is abundantly clear that they're all very, very similar to one another. And if we count up the number of differences between them, it's five or 600 differences. Maybe as many as 800 at the most can explain all the men in the world. Oh. Wait a minute. At, at a mutation rate that we know, we'd expect a couple of mutations per generation. That's only a few hundred generations. That's biblical time frame right there. For the mitochondrial DNA, uh, most people in the world are about 20 to 25 mutations separated from the mitochondrial ancestor, Eve. Um, well, that's just a few hundred generations. Uh -huh. So what we're seeing here, uh, there's a stark difference between uh, a genesis a paradigm approach to how man began and how long he's been around as opposed to the conventional paradigm that says man has been around for millions of years and in various stages. And what you're saying is the genetics don't seem to support that. The genetics, if we use real world mutation rates measured in the laboratory, the genetics indicates that man is very recent. But there's another factor we also have to account for and that is 
what happens to mutations over time in a population. See, every child that's born has more mutations than the parent was born with. That means that every generation is actually a step down from the ancestors. Mm -hmm. And at the rate we can measure, it's, I mean, 60 to 100 mutations per generation is a nice average. At that rate, we will go extinct before millions of years happens. Hmm. So there, there are really two uh, ways to look at this uh, issue. One is how fast the mutations are changing. And because of that, we can't have been around that long. That's right. But if we have been around that long, that mutation rate would have would have killed we, us. We'd be, yeah, we'd be we dead. would be extinct. The standard model, the evolutionary model, requires that mutations are removed over time. But there's not enough time. Mm. There's too many mutations, and it overwhelms them mathematically. Back in the 1950s, this famous um, scientist named Haldane, he said that if there's as many as one mutation per every 10 children, we're guaranteed to go extinct. Huh. Well, there's about 100 per child. That's a 1,000 times worse than the worst case scenario they could handle mathematically. And what you're saying then is that this evidence really is pointing back again to the biblical historical record. Absolutely. Absolutely. When we look at just people all around the world, they're so similar to each other. It's clear we came from actually an atom. Mm -hmm. So little me, like I used to have red, a red beard, right? It's all white now, but <laughs> this red is a yeah. mutation. It's a broken gene. Mm. I, I don't have brown hair anymore or the skin color that my, some one of my ancestors picked up. This is a broken gene. We even know where gene is. We know what letter change happened in that gene. Mm. Okay. And all Europeans share that skin color. It's a broken gene. So we need a little bit of genetic diversity, 6,000 years of mutation, mm -hmm. and we can explain people with no common ancestry with to chimpanzees. We don't need millions of years. We don't need, we don't need evolution. Concerning the chimpanzee, the conventional paradigm tells us over and over again that we have like 98% uh, similar genetic code with the chimpanzee. Is that true? It is absolutely not true that we're 98% identical to chimpanzees. Uh, some of my colleagues have run the numbers. And when you just take a piece of the chimpanzee genome and, and look at, at the human genome, you get about 80% identity. And when you do the reverse, you get about 80% identity. This 98% was a myth. Hmm. When they um, sequenced the chimpanzee genome, they didn't want to spend $3 billion on it. That's how much it took to do the first human genome. In order to sequence a genome back then, what they would do is they would randomly sequence lots and lots of little pieces, about 300 base pairs long. And then they would line them up. They use a big computer program to line them up. Mm -hmm. And if you had enough pieces, you'd fill all the holes. And it, you have to sequence it about 30 fold over. And then you have enough to make sure you don't have a gap. Oh. When they did the chimpanzee genome, they sequenced it five times over and lined it up on the human genome. Oh. So they assumed common ancestry without ever okay. testing it. And they made a Swiss cheese genome. There are so many holes in the chimpanzee genome, it's, it's, it's not usable. So several years later, someone went back and they only resequenced just the Y chromosome. And it was, it turned out to be radically different. Oh. The Y chromosome in chimpanzee is half the size of the Y chromosome in human. And of the half that they share with us, it's only 70% similar to the human version. The, the paper that did it, they said that that was as much difference as we expected between man and something like a chicken. Well, for sure, what we know is that the human being is radically different than any of the other animals Absolutely. that we see around us. Absolutely. In fact, it's only the human being that can create that scuba gear that I was wearing to keep me alive underneath the water. That the human kind is the only kind, the only species that God created that has the capacity to wonder and marvel about the world that God created. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to learn more about them. But in the remaining time, maybe we can do some more underwater stuff. Huh? The weather's really nice. Let's go on another yeah. dive. Let's do it. So what would I be doing on my next dive? The next dive would be the same as the first dive. Yeah. Maybe you'll stop and have more time to stare at something. Yeah. It would have to be a guided dive.